the way, I, I cannot see the, uh, the recording is in progress. I cannot see the questions in the chat because I have the full screen with my sheets in front of me. So if you can uh, read the questions, that would be great. So thank you for having me. I'm actually very honored to present today uh, you uh, my research. And I have to admit, it is really a work in progress. Um, and the research that I'm going to present to you today is actually part of a larger Veni project as Eduardo just mentioned. I'm really in the initial phase where I am conducting the desk research uh, to really get to know the institutional investors in the Netherlands. And that's also what my Veni is about. So I'm actually investigating what role institutional investors can play in the Netherlands in um, um, driving sustainability and to, to um, obtain more sustainable companies. And today I'm actually going to present you part of this research um, where I focus on the institutional investor voting behavior. So uh, to briefly summarize, and then I go in depth uh, into my research, I actually estimated the ideology of the investors using a research framework from political sciences. And this is the W nominate model, which was also used in the 2020 study of Patrick Bolton and others. And that's why I actually uh, picked the ID form and um, I'm trying to, to also um, apply that to the Dutch institutional investors and in my research framework to get a bit of uh, a hint of how these parties interact and uh, what their ideology is to, uh, with respect to sustainability. So you may all know that um, the role of shareholders has significantly changed over the past years. So before there was this huge focus on shareholder rights, and there is actually still a huge focus on shareholder rights, but now shareholders also um, are uh, having more duties and more specifically the institutional investors. So institutional investors are really pushed to become good stewards and steer companies with their engagement in the direction of long-term value creation and sustainability. And this changing role, and I'm going to outline the legal framework in a bit, uh, but it stems from the premise that institutional investors can actually use their shareholder rights to foster long-term uh, value creation and non-financial performance, including, for instance, environmental and social factors, as you can also see on this sheet um, in the preamble of the shareholder rights directive, the revised one. Um, and it is actually quite a debate whether institutional investors actually have the right incentives to take part um, as being active stewards and to foster sustainability. And I know some of you are also really active in this debate, um, but we see that this premise actually um, well, was followed in the past years and that different shareholder duties were implemented. Um, and there are some soft and hard uh, regulatory duties as the next sheet um, shows you. So here I outlined actually for the Netherlands, uh, the different shareholder duties uh, institutional investors particularly need to comply with. And you can see that there is both hard and soft law involved. Um, I think most of you are familiar with the legal framework, but just to be um, quick, uh, to give you a quick overview. So we, of course, have the shelter rights directive, the revised one, the second one. And here it is determined that asset owners and asset managers need to develop their um, engagement policy and implement also this policy report on this implementation and also related to their voting behavior. This is Article 3G. Uh, um, then there is some information disclosure about the arrangement between the asset owner and the asset manager. So as you know, the asset owner, including pension funds, uh, but also insurance companies, they usually use asset managers to manage their assets and invest on their behalf, uh, um, depending on, of course, what the arrangement is about. And Article 3 uh, H actually determines that uh, there needs to be some information disclosed about these arrangements. And finally, um, also asset managers, according to Article 3, uh, I need to actually disclose to the asset owner how their investment strategy um, and the implementation of this investment strategy actually complies with the arrangement they have with the asset owner. Um, and these the, uh, shareholder duties, like in other European member states, are um, included in the Dutch national legal framework, uh, more specifically the VFT, the Dutch uh, Financial Supervision Act, in the articles um, of uh, Chapter 5, um, 7, uh, 87C to E. 
Um, then we have the Dutch Pension Act that requires pension funds to disclose how their investment policy includes sustainability matters like, for instance, climate issues and human rights. Um, and of course, we have the fin Sustainable Finance Disclosure Regulation that was um, will be actually fully implemented um, or was implemented fully, but there will still be some um, regulatory technical standards that will be issued in uh, probably July 2022. And here you see that uh, institutional investors, um, financial market participants, so both asset owners and asset managers actually need to, um, well, need to disclose how they integrate sustainability risks in their investment uh, decision-making process, and particularly how they also consider principal adverse impacts. Um, and they even can pick, um, so they have a choice between Article 8 and Article 9, as regards to whether their financial project products actually promote um, sustainability um, characteristics or that they really have uh, sustainable investment as their primary objective. And there has been some studies, including in the Netherlands and the AFM, the Dutch uh, Financial Authority, actually indicated that there is still some greenwashing going on uh, with respect to the implementation of the uh, SFDR at this moment. Um, and then finally, we have, as regards the hard law framework, the taxonomy, uh, which, of course, um, is about the classification of green investments. And institutional investors need to report which investments can actually be classified as being a green investment. Um, sorry for this boring overview, perhaps, but I think it's good to sketch the, the legal outline. Um, so we also have uh, soft law in the Netherlands, including the Dutch corporate governance codes, where also um, related a bit to the um, um, SRD2, uh, institutional investors need to disclose their voting policy and also report on the implementation of this policy, including how they actually voted their shares. And then we have the Dutch stewardship codes, which was implemented inter alia uh, by um, Umedion, um, so it's it's not really a legal um, instrument, but it's more a sectoral initiative, you can say. And here we see different duties of institutional investors, um, including, for instance, um, that they have to use informed voting, which means that they actually need to vote in accordance with the voting policy that they disclose on their websites. Um, and then finally, and I actually forgot to include this in my draft report that you received, um, uh, are the International Responsible Business Conduct Agreements, um, because we also have two for, uh, so one for pension funds and one for insurance companies in the Netherlands. And interestingly, and that's why I wanted to mention them on uh, the sheet, and you can see here the Dutch quotes, but of course I will translate. Um, so for instance, here you see the um, the IRBC agreements uh, for the pension funds uh, stating that actually uh, these pension funds, these asset owners need to use the shell the rights to let their investee companies take responsibility for their actions if they are harmful for sustainability. Um, and you see here the um, provision for the pension funds, but in the insurance companies um, um, agreements, you can find a similar one. So this is soft law. It's um, uh, sectoral agreements um, related to the, the SER in the Netherlands. Um, so this is a little bit the, the or a quick overview of the institutional investor duties in the Netherlands. And now I would like to actually um, go on with the tools that shareholders, particularly these institutional investors have to engage with, uh, with companies. So um, you probably all know that shareholders have different rights, including formal rights like voting rights, where they can vote with uh, on important corporate decisions. But they also can, for instance, support sustainability proposals from other shareholders or put a sustainability proposal themselves on the AGM agenda. Um, we also have these forum rights, uh, meaning that shareholders can actually ask questions in the AGM and to start a dialogue with the company, which is a formal right, because this is also part of the Dutch civil codes. And then we have all kinds of information rights, um, for instance, related to, uh, at this moment, to also non-financial aspects, uh, like outlined in the non-financial reporting directive, but also uh, that will probably be replaced by the corporate sustainability reporting directive, um, maybe soon, uh, the, the 
the, the trajectory is not completely known yet. Um, but these are the formal rights shelters have. And of course, you all know that also shelters, and particularly institutional investors, also have these informal engagement tools, meaning that they actually can engage behind the scenes uh, by sending emails to companies, they can send letters, or they can have phone calls, set up a private meeting, etc. So they also can have a dialogue behind the scenes. And the um, engagement policies that I already um, looked into show that most of the uh, tools that institutional investors use are actually um, engagement tools behind the scenes, which is probably not surprisingly. Um, yet, although most of them actually use um, engagement behind the scenes, in this particular research, I'm actually focusing on voting rights because it um, allows me to test whether the claims of institutional investors in their engagement policies and voting policies are actually um, carried out in practice. So whether they actually, um, 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 well, vote according to what they promise. So in this particular research that I'm presenting you today, I'm focusing on voting rights, but in the Feni project, of course, I'm also taking into account all the other aspects, including the informal engagement tools that uh, institutional investors use. So I, I just told you that institutional investors often state, or some of them state in their uh, voting policies that they want to use their voting rights to foster sustainability goals, and they actually support then uh, these sustainability proposals. And I am interested in um, whether there is really an alignment uh, between what they promise to do in their engagement policies, voting policies, and what they actually do. So you can say uh, that the underlying question of this research is, okay, to, to get to know the institutional investors in the Netherlands and to see whether their promises and actions are actually aligned. And I also mentioned in, in my draft reports um, that I sent, uh, or Edu actually sent to you last week, that also uh, in different reports, we see that the Dutch institutional investors are ranked uh, among the most um, uh, sustainable investors across the uh, globe. Um, and here you can see the share action reports ranking the Dutch institutional investors actually in the top 10 um, in terms of um, asset managers and um, in terms of insurance companies. So um, this is a little bit the introduction to the research. And now I would like to actually um, continue with the empirical part of my research where I really explore their actual voting behavior. And the first step to do this was for me to map the institutional investors, because as you may know, um, the institutional landscape in all countries, but also in the Netherlands, is quite complex because asset owners are using different asset managers. And then you also have fiduciary managers that um, take a bit of a bigger role than simply doing asset management. And therefore, I um, wanted to map the relationships uh, between the institutional investors in the Netherlands. And here you can see an overview in a network construction from the of the findings from my first desk research. Um, I have to already make a disclaimer, so not all parties are included yet. Um, I actually wasn't able to find some of the asset managers of some Dutch pension funds like PBL Pension. Uh, you can see that um, on the left of the sheets, uh, so you can see that this dot is not connected to anything else, uh, which doesn't mean that they don't have an asset manager. I just wasn't able to find their asset management uh, manager in their disclosures uh, from their websites. Um, so you can see in the network that the dark blue notes denotes the asset owner, a light blue note denotes the asset manager. Um, and we also have an orange arrow, which I use to define a relationship between the asset owner and the asset manager. So it's an asset management arrangement and a purple arrow uh, arrow denotes, uh, sorry, arrow denotes the uh, fiduciary management arrangement. So we have um, some kind of master manager arrangement between an asset owner and an asset manager. And the um, asset manager then, the fiduciary manager, takes care of all the aspects of asset management, including also um, monitoring and making arrangements with other asset managers uh, that the um, asset owner works with. So it's a big of a, um, a more uh, complete relationship, you can say. And the bigger nodes in the network connect um, 
well, show actually the institutional investor that has more connections in the network. So you can see, for instance, uh, Armea uh, Investment Management is a very big asset manager in the Netherlands. So the initial idea um, after I mapped this, and you can see also, or you can actually spot some flaws as well, because you see UBS um, on the right and on the left. So I needed to code this in such a way that the names are actually fully aligned. Uh, but this is already giving you some uh, hints of how the Dutch market looks like. And the initial idea I have was to actually gather the voting data from all these institutional parties in the Dutch markets. Um, however, I soon found out that uh, there was a lack of data availability because some uh, asset owners obviously uh, doesn't, uh, they, they don't vote themselves. Um, but the fiduciary manager or the asset manager votes on their behalf. Whereas other asset owners actually in the Netherlands, including uh, for instance, PMT and PME, PMA and PMT, so Dutch, uh, two Dutch uh, pension funds, big pension funds, they actually do sometimes vote themselves. So I'm still um, in doubt how to actually um, identify the different parties, but so far what I did now is I use the proxy insights database to identify as much institutional Dutch parties as I um, was able to, to find there. So here you can see the data set that I use for this initial research. So I really have to add, it's really work in progress and I'm trying to still optimize the um, sample that I'm going to use for the actual research. But I, yeah, you know, time flies and I, I needed to deliver something for this presentation. So I already constructed the research based on the sample that I have gathered today. And in this sample, um, there are, um, as you can see, 22 Dutch asset owners, large Dutch asset owners and 12 Dutch asset managers. Um, and those include also the largest fiduciary managers in the Dutch market. Um, I also include uh, to compare um, to what extent Dutch institutional investors are actually sustainable. I also included 70 international um, institutional investors and I selected them simply um, related to their asset under management. So I just selected the 70 largest um, institutional investors reported as um, large related to their asset under management in the proxy inside database. And you can see that uh, about um, well, most of them are actually international asset managers, including, for instance, BlackRock, Vanguard, and State Street. And I also have some international asset owners. And I recognize that this sample is not optimal yet because there are way more international asset um, managers involved in my data sets, whereas I actually have for the Dutch markets more asset owners. So I need to align that more, but I wanted to already show you the first results. Um, you may also notice that the table is a bit different from what I reported last week. And that's because I first used the classification in the proxy inside database, but later on, I actually reclassified some institutional investors. So for instance, as there Nederlands, um, who is actually um, was recorded as an asset manager in the proxy inside database, I classified it as an asset owner because it's a large insurance company and it actually does its own asset management. Um, so that's what I um, changed. And so I also changed some other um, institutional investors. So you may already recognize that I need to um, have a good classification framework in order to make sure that I put all the different institutional investors in the categories they belong to. Um, so this is the overview of the sample that I have now, and I would like to show um, the results. But of course, before I do that, we also need the shareholder proposal data. So here you can see the shareholder proposal data that I used um, in this research. Um, and I used also for this the proxy inside database. And I uh, actually retrieved all the sustainability proposals from the proxy inside database for the 2016 to 2021 period. Um, so you can see that the sample actually includes over 3,000 uh, sustainability proposals, which is actually also quite uh, more than uh, the work of Patrick Bolton and his co-authors uh, included because they had about 170 sustainability proposals. And of course, my research is really focusing on sustainability. So that, of course, makes sense that there is uh, that difference. Um, 
I also added some more information for you compared to the draft report. So I added also the average percentage in favor of all investors in our sample and the Dutch investors separately. And you see that um, the Dutch investors actually seem to vote more often in favor of sustainability proposals. Um, you also may note that the approval rate in our sample for charitable uh, donations is a bit odd. And this uh, is because so the final column actually shows the um, the voting outcomes as reported in the proxy inside database. And for most proposal categories, uh, the most uh, of these voting outcomes item uh, voting outcomes is known in the proxy inside database. But actually, for this a particular category, there was only about 100 of those proposals that were reported uh, with a voting outcome. So that's explains the big difference between our sample and um, the um, uh, average voting outcome as reported in the uh, proxy insights database and when you look into these proposals then uh, you see that most uh, of these 1400 proposals were put at companies in turkey um, egypt china and oman and some other countries and they may actually be controversial um, maybe they're put uh, at companies with a high ownership uh, concentration uh, which may explain the large descent rates in our sample versus uh, the actual uh, voting outcome uh, reported by proxy insights um, so in any case because this category is a bit um, well, it's, it's a bit of an outlier, this category, with a lot of proposals. I also estimated some models over the weekend without this category. So I actually also estimated all the models without charitable donations. And um, I will show you that the results are very robust. Um, and then you can also see on this table that I also added the voting data on direct elections at the Dutch AGMs. And I did this as a robustness check as well um, in a second uh, dimension. So I use a one dimensional and two dimensional model, which I will explain to you in a bit. Um, but these are the um, shelter proposals and management proposals that I could find on sustainability um, in the proxy insights database. So the next step is then to determine the voting data uh, behavior of shareholders. Um, and of course, you can simply analyze the proportion of yes votes for each institutional investor. And that's what I did. And here you can see uh, the results. Um, you can see actually in the upper part of the table. So of course, I didn't report the full table because it wouldn't fit on the sheet. But you see that many Dutch institutional investors actually have quite high approval rates for sustainability resolutions. On the next sheet, that I will show you now, you see the investors with the lowest approval rates for sustainability proposals. And here you can see that not that many Dutch institutional investors are included anymore. We see mostly international asset managers um, and um, some pension funds as well. Um, but the thing is that this really doesn't indicate a lot because as you can see from the table the institutional investors not always vote on the same proposals and actually some proposals may be more challenging for the corporate management in terms of sustainability goals than the others and um, because we have these voting data we can actually um, show which institutional investors actually agree most with each other and who are actually more deviating from each other so you can in a way estimate based on the voting data so not just reporting the average um, votes in favor and against but you can actually map the ideology um, of the different inst uh, institutional investors based on their voting behavior and agreements with each other related to these sustainability proposals so i was looking for a model to actually say a bit more about their agreements and how they are aligned to each other um, related to their voting behavior. And that's uh, why I actually um, estimated the model as Bolton and the other authors did in their 2020 paper. And I'm going to show you this now, uh, but of course, first I need to tell you a bit more about the methodology. So there are actually quite a lot of um, models in political sciences um, that estimate the ideology of legislators in um, roll calls. So how legislators voted, including uh, Democrats and Republicans. 
and they um, in a way can estimate their ideology and um, you see that these models uh, that analyze these uh, voting behaviors of legislators in um, in political sciences are often referred to as ideal point estimators. So they allow for uh, identifying the directors, or sorry, not directors, legislator in, in this case, uh, location in an abstract policy or ideological space using their voting behavior. Um, and this is also, um, one of these models is the W nominate model, um, which is actually a version of the nominate model that has been the standard um, in the political science field since the, I think it was the 1980s. And there were really a lot of citations um, or papers that actually use these models, um, this, these, these nominate models before. So in line with Patrick Bolton and the other authors from the 2020 papers, I actually also chose to use the uh, W nominate model. Um, and I'm going to tell you a bit more about it, but know that it's actually quite established in the political science literature. So such a, a spatial model like the W voting model allows you to not only study the voting outcomes as such, but actually determine the ideology of the Dutch institutional investors in my case, based on their binary choice voting data. So I need to have a binary choice. So they actually vote in favor or they don't vote in favor. And the model in a way takes into account the agreement scores and the voting behavior of institutional investors and determines their ideology based on this. And I put on the sheet, the general idea of the model to make it very clear. So you see that for each proposal, institutional investors actually assign utilities to the two outcomes represented by either approval or dismissal of a proposal. And the key assumptions of the model um, includes that institutional investors have single peaked preferences. So they either like uh, or prefer approval or prefer dismissal of a particular proposal. Um, and they also vote for that outcome that is closest to their ideal point. So they either like approval better than dismissal and thus they uh, vote for approval, but that is subject to a random error. And based on their voting behavior, you can then plot the ideal points of institutional investors on a spatial model from minus one to plus one. And I modeled it in such a way that on the left-hand side, so the minus side, there are the more social or sustainability conscience um, investors, so those that vote more often in favor of uh, sustainability proposals and plus one are the more classical, maybe Milton Friedman minded um, investors that more often um, dismiss a sustainability proposal. So to give you a little bit of more insights on how this model works, actually, I think the um, um, example of Keith Paul's book, one of the uh, founders of the W nominate model, um, works very well to explain it to you. And you see here on the left of the sheet, uh, a figure with six legislators who vote on five roll calls. And you also see the cutting point C that divide the yes voters. So the six legislators, some of them vote yes from the no voters. So you have per voting item, you have also cutting points. These are denoted by Z. Every voter to the left of a cutting point votes yes and to the right votes no. And a voter that is located directly on the cutting point C uh, for a specific proposal would be indifferent because uh, the distance between yes and no is equal. So he would be indifferent um, being located at the cutting point C for a particular proposal. So based on this information, we can actually calculate the points, the locations of the, direct, of the legislators in a spatial model. And that is shown by Paul in the next example. And he first in his book also recognizes that we will never see such perfect data in practice. And that's why he slightly amends the data um, set, this small data set, uh, where he um, actually changes some of the votes of the uh, legislators. And you can also note that the uh, column and rows are reversed um, because that's also the format of the data that is used in the W nominate model. So, Based on this small data set where we have um, only uh, a few legislators and only a few vocals, we can um, calculate the uh, locations of these legislators. And how do we do that? 
Well, you can see that there are three uh, matri uh, matrices added to the sheets, and these are also representing the steps that we need to take. So first, we actually um, need to calculate the agreement score matrix, which is the first matrix um, below the data set. And you see that the upper side of the matrix is not displayed, but of course, it's the same as the lower side. So you have to imagine that this matrix is full um, instead of only half. Um, and you can see that the agreement scores are simply calculated. Uh, for instance, take uh, the agreement score between legislator five and six. You see that it is 0 0.80 or 80% because uh, legislator five and six agree four out of five times. So the first step is really simple. You need to um, calculate the agreement scores. Then the next step is to calculate the matrices of squared distances, which means that we actually subtract the agreement scores from one and square the differences. Then the third step is to normalize the matrix in such a way that we obtain the double centered matrix. And you do that by deducting the row and column means per entry at the matrix mean and divide by minus two. And in this way, you can see it if you if you would imagine that the matrix is full, you see that um, you get a matrix where the sum of the columns and rows are zero. So it's a normalized matrix. And finally, um, that's the final step. You need to take the square root of the diagonal elements of this normalized matrix. And then you actually have the values uh, of the legislator points on the a minus one plus one space or dimension. And these are the voter points. Um, so I used uh, for my research to include this um, and do these transformations, I used the W nominate package developed by uh, Pool and others in R uh, because I had over 3000 voting items and over 100 institutional investors. But of course you can also do it uh, by hand or using uh, MATLAB, um, but the idea is the same as this example. The last thing that I need to tell you about the model is that, um, so it is based on the geometry that was just shown on the previous sheet. So the book of um, Paul uh, shows us, but I also um, already explained that one of the key assumptions is that the W nominate model adds an error to the simple spatial model. And therefore it um, can be considered an estimation method that maximizes actually the um, uh, correct classification of the voter choices or um, so it's, it's estimating their points. So without an error term, the voter would vote de uh, deterministically, which means that the voter always votes for the alternative that is closest uh, to its position in the policy space. However, when we add a random error, the voter, depending on this random error, sometimes votes for the closest alternative and sometimes not. Um, and the error term is introduced using a random utility model. Um, and you can see that it's Euclidean in the sense that the voter is always more likely to choose the alternative that's closest to her or his ideal points um, compared to the alternative outcome that is farther away. But that decision is subject to a random error. So the voter um, actually assigns utility to two possibilities um, per voting item, so dismissal and approval. And um, the utility associated with the alternative is determined by uh, the deter deterministic components, so the, uh, the, the distance between the position and the outcome, and partly by this random error. Uh, which is called the stochastic components. And I added on the sheet that this actually follows uh, a logit distribution. Um, so this is actually how the W nominate model works. So it actually calculates the utility difference between voting yes and voting no or nay uh, on a proposal. And that arises from the location of the voter and the location of the two outcomes of that proposal. Um, so that's a little bit how this model works, and I hope that you uh, were able to, to follow this more or less. Um, what I still want to add uh, in the discussion on this model that you can also use it for multiple dimensions. So the other examples that I just showed you is really a one dimensional model where you have one ideology and voters, in my case institutional investors, are mapped on one line. 
Um, you can also use it for multiple dimensions. And I added as a robustness check, a second dimension to see whether the first dimension, the sustainability versus not so sustainability would still be um, the same. So I added a second dimension um, where you have the uh, director um, election proposals for the Dutch um, meetings, so for the, for the Dutch companies. Um, and I added the voting behavior of the institutional investors related to these proposals. And you can see that now the location of each institutional investor is not represented on a line, but it's actually represented as a vector where you have the coordinates uh, X and Y or dimension one and dimension two that the, together determine actually the location of that particular institutional investor. So institutional investors, um, you have now a cutting line per proposal, as you can see on this sheet. And that's actually similar to the cutting points in a one dimensional model. But now for each proposal, the two dimensions are taken into account and the investor that is actually located at the cutting line would be indifferent then for voting yes or voting no related to a particular proposal. So this is the theory. And now I, I think I'm entering the fun part because I now can show you some of the results. So in the uh, draft report, I used a an, an, an simple R um, um, uh, figure to show you the ideology. But I think Søren actually mentioned correctly that I should have uh, shown all the names so that you can directly see who is sustainable and who is not. So I changed the figure a bit and added the names, to, so the labels to, to uh, the different uh, data points. And here you see that the institutional investors that are closely together um, are actually more aligned than others. And the interesting thing is that it may also actually signal that they communicate or coordinate voting. Um, so it's also signaling that perhaps if institutional investors are very closely related, that maybe they have the same asset manager or share some policies. And we see this, for instance, with PME and PMT uh, in the Netherlands to pension funds. Um, so as I already indicated, I set the model in such a way that minus one is more sustainability oriented um, um, ideology versus plus one is the more classical money conscious investor um, ideology. Um, and here you can see actually that uh, the Dutch institutional investors have a more sustainability ideology than the international institutional investors in our sample or most of them. Um, and it's also interesting to see that BlackRock is actually located more to the upper right. So it's, it's um, really more a classical investor in my model. And ISS is actually more sustainability oriented than Glass Lewis, as you can also see on uh, the figure. So here you see um, the detailed overview of the ideologies I've found. Um, so the draft reports, um, I, I think actually I made the a classical mistake uh, that I always teach to my students to never do that, but I put in the results by hand and I wanted to add PGGM to the table and then I missed uh, some of the um, entries. So I actually reported some of the results wrongly in the draft report. So here you have the actual results just created uh, with R in a table, which is a bit, uh, well, less dangerous, of course, because it's less prone to mistakes. Um, and I also added uh, the standard errors to the table uh, with 50 bootstrap iterations. So they actually became stable around 50 bootstraps iterations. Um, so the standard errors are reported as well. And I think I also estimated um, compared to the draft reports, the um, sample of sustainability proposals without the charitable uh, donations. And you can see that these results are quite uh, stable, quite robust. Actually, they're very robust because the um, correlation between all the models in the first dimension is over uh, 0 0.97%. Uh, uh, so it's really, um, the, there are really high correlations uh, between the positions of the, the uh, in the first dimension. So the first ideology estimated by the different models. Um, interestingly, maybe, uh, and it's just speculative, but uh, you see that the standard errors, so the, the error terms are um, lower for the um, left wing extremists, so the more 
sustainable oriented investors than for the right wing as um, extremists so for the right wing investors which may signal that um, it's very clear that if you have a sustainability um, ideology how you should vote whereas if uh, the um, the right wing investors have a bit more trouble um, identifying who they are and how they need to vote. This is just an interpretation from my side, um, but we see relatively higher standard errors for some of the right wing um, investors and also BlackRock shows quite um, a high standard error compared to uh, some other institutional investors in the sample. Um, so here you can find a comparison with the data for the latest years, so 2020 and 2021, to see whether the ideology was actually consistent throughout the years. And you see that um, um, the models are again quite similar. So although there has been a lot of attention on the past years um, on responsible investment, uh, we see that um, the ideology actually remains quite stable. And then I estimated some other models, um, also because of a suggestion of Siren. So thank you, Siren, for, for that. Um, I hope you like these additional um, estimates that I'm now showing. So um, he asked me to, to define a bit more um, the different categories, just to estimate the ideology scores for the different uh, shelter proposal categories or management proposal categories. And you see here that um, actually there are um, um, different categories included in the um, in the graph, including environmental, social proposals, climate proposals, and then I uh, differentiated between the climate proposals for 2020, 2021, and for the climate proposal for 2021. And you can see that BlackRock is slightly moving towards uh, a more sustainable strategy because, as they promised. The climate uh, proposals for 2021, they actually already supported more of them or um, more specifically, it's as I just mentioned, it's not about the number of proposals they support, but how much they are um, um, alike other more sustainable minded investors. And you can see that BlackRock actually is moving more to the center, although it's still on the right wing. Um, and I also uh, looked into uh, a quote to see whether indeed BlackRock was um, 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 advocating that it would become more supportive of sustainability proposals. Um, and I found in their stewardship report from um, May 2021, so the first quarter of 2021, that uh, it indeed signals that they are more supportive of these proposals. But I actually had to look for a better quote that they were actually going to uh, support also more climate related uh, proposals. But I wasn't able to find uh, a better quote before this presentation. What I also did is, um, and I did that analysis yesterday, is to actually include um, BlackRock ESG funds. So, of course, I focus on the investor level in uh, this research, as I also outlined in the paper, but of course, BlackRock and all the other bigger asset managers, they have different funds. And part of uh, BlackRock funds are also more sustainable funds. And I included these as a separate investor in the next analysis. So from the proxy data, uh, proxy inside database, I was able to retrieve different funds that were actually more sustainable uh, or BlackRock advocates that those are the sustainable funds. And I try to see whether uh, or not their ideology is actually different compared to um, the standard BlackRock funds. And I have that analysis on this sheet. And here you can actually see the results. So um, in general, we see that um, the um, BlackRock um, ideal points for the ESG funds are still quite right wing, um, but you also see that for the climate 2021 proposals, the ESG funds of BlackRock are approaching the um, a zero score, meaning that they are right in the middle. So they become more centric uh, compared to the other institutional investors in the sample. But we still see that the Dutch institutional investors um, score way more um, uh, score way more on this scale in terms of their uh, sustainability ideology. Um, so for the climate proposals in 2021, 
I have the data um, for Blackrock and I need to think. I thought there were 34 um, proposals that they voted for in favor and 21 against. And in any case, they voted against the follow this 2021 proposal at Shell's meeting. Um, so they indicated as a rationale of voting against um, that um, they, and I think actually, yes, I included it on the sheet. They say, okay, um, they prefer to say on climate proposal. So you see that BlackRock ESG is moving towards um, the more middle uh, part of the uh, spatial model where they are a bit more neutral, not very sustainable ideology yet compared to the Dutch institutional investors, but they are moving towards a more sustainable uh, ideology, yet they voted against uh, the follow this um, sh uh, shell proposal in 2021. That brings me to the final bit of my presentation. Um, because I also still want you to sh or to show you the case study that I did on the follow this proposals. Um, so you may know, and maybe I should have told you before I mentioned follow this a couple of times in this presentation, but follow this is um, an activist Dutch shareholder. It can also actually be considered an NGO that's every time puts sustainability proposals on the uh, AGM agendas of large companies, including Shell, to get uh, more Paris alignment. And uh, this year, actually, something interesting happened, as you may all know, because uh, a lot of attention was paid to these proposals. Um, not just follow this, put a proposal on the agenda of Shell's AGM, but Shell also put its own climate proposal on the agenda. So they offered a say on climate to shareholders. And the follow this proposal received the most uh, votes in favor of all their proposals in the past. So over 30% of the votes they received in favor, but Shell's own proposal received almost 90% of the votes in favor. And we see actually, if you analyze the behavior of the different institutional investors, you see that actually some of the institutional investors that voted um, previously in favor of the um, follow this uh, proposal, for instance, in 2020, they actually now voted in favor of the climate resolution of Shell itself, and thus voted against or abstained from voting from the follow this proposal. Whereas other institutional investors actually supported follow this for the first time. Um, for instance, PGGM, if I remember correctly, and from the international institutional investors, this was BMO, uh, which is one of the uh, bigger fiduciary managers across uh, the world. Um, and I thought, okay, it would be interesting to also analyze this, these proposals and particularly to follow this proposal with the W nominate model. Um, and I used uh, the two dimensional model to um, get a little bit of a fancier graph so that uh, we can really see in a two dimensional space, the, um, um, the, the institutional investor positions related to the proposal. And you can already see in this um, table, that um, the fraction correctly classified votes with the W nominate model for the two shell proposals in 2021 was actually quite low compared to the earlier follow this proposals. And also the sample average of correctly classified votes in my research with the, um, um, yeah, with the um, W nominate model is actually 90%. Uh, so you see that actually the, um, yeah, it, the model also feels that it's harder to estimate it and reports more error votes uh, than for the sample average. And finally, and then I will stop talking, uh, here you see the outcome of the uh, follow this shell 2021 resolution. And here you see actually that uh, the cutting line is very uh, close to 90 degrees, which means that it's fully a one dimensional uh, voting item and uh, you see that some of the institutional investors that actually voted no were supposed to vote yes, because on the left-hand side, those institutional investors, according to the model, should have voted yes. Whereas, for instance, APG, which is the asset manager of uh, ABP, our um, from university also, our own pension fund, actually voted against. Um, so according to my model that I estimated, ABP should have actually voted in favor of the 2021 follow this uh, shell proposal. 
Uh, but instead, they actually abstained from voting and they voted in favor of Shell's own resolution. So to conclude, um, so first of all, thank you for listening to me. I hope I didn't spend too much time on explaining all the research elements. Um, but very quickly, the, the goals of the research. So the first goal really was to get to know the Dutch institutional investor landscape and to verify or falsify actually their claims uh, based on voting data. And in the next part of the research, I also would like to conduct interviews um, and other um, steps to really um, really uh, unravel all the different aspects of institutional investor engagement behavior and how they actually impact sustainability. Um, so for this research, I um, showed that um, based on a um, political science methodology, you could map the uh, similarity between institutional investors and their ideology based on voting records. And the questions that I still would like to answer is, okay, indeed, what drives uh, Dutch institutional investors? Also, Sura mentioned that before. So what makes those institutional investors more sustainable than the other international institutional investors? And I also would like to uh, finalize the sample uh, because one of the things that I didn't include yet is, as you all know, what happened on the Exxon Mobile proxy context last year is that also director elections can actually play a large role in sustainability. So I also would like to add proposals related to director elections, voting behavior related to director elections in this research. Um, so that's actually the bigger picture. And I think I'm going to stop here because otherwise I uh, don't have any time left for questions. So thank you for your attention yeah. and sorry, Edo, for, for talking yeah. so much today. It's perfectly okay. Thank you very much. It was very clear and uh, very insightful. Uh, before opening the floor, I, I had two questions. One, one comment, more than a question, uh, from Maria Bartol on um, uh, the EU taking action indeed uh, to uh, against BlackRock, but more in general to include ESG factor into uh, the regulatory framework. Um, and then another clarificatory question, I, uh, I should have taken that before, but I missed it, sorry, uh, on uh, the difference between uh, uh, BlackRock rationale and ESG uh, fund of BlackRock rationale in, in, uh, in voting. Uh, from Jesper, so if then you want to, to bring it up, Jesper, feel free. Uh, I, I give the floor first to uh, Giuseppe, who was the first to raise his hand. So, Anne, thanks a lot for this uh, presentation. It's really amazing uh, project and, and super interesting. So I'm going to ask you the easy question, like, you know, what do you think about drivers for what you find? Easy for me to ask, in a sense, because it really comes out naturally from your uh, um, uh, data and results. So I, I thought of you know three possible ways in which you could rationalize what's going on here. One is that Bolton uh, finds that uh, public uh, pension funds are more to the left than other institutional investors. And in the Netherlands, if I understood it correctly, you're looking at pension funds. So that's pretty much in line with what he says. Um, and then next, thinking about why the pension funds could be more to the left than, uh, than other funds. Um, so it could be that they have more stable investors in the sense that, you know, people invest, especially in, in Europe, in a pension fund for their life, and then they are sort of, uh, uh, you know, loyal customers of their, of their institutional investors, right? This might not be the case with uh, other types of institutional investors like mutual funds, for example. So this, this sort of uh, federalization could be uh, affecting the ability of, uh, of investors to coordinate and put pressure on management, on fund managers to, uh, to change their course, which I think it's your story about uh, ABP, for example, right? So they, they, you know, these investors are better coordinated and then they can use voice rather than exit in, in terms of pushing the fund to do differently. Uh, and the other possibility is sort of uh, specific to this country and it could be related to the, the, the Dutch proximity to environmental risks. You know, which has been an historical uh, high levels uh, since you know ever, <laughs> uh, and and therefore you know maybe that the investors are just more easily uh, attuned to environmental risk, and this is as, as more real and a more realistic possibility than do people in other countries who you know maybe that just shave off the the thought of of having to deal with that, and they think it's for next generations, while the Dutch. You know, 
a citizens are just used to deal with that and they see it as more real and therefore they are more willing to put pressure so i was you know i guess you have to speculate here and, and guess i don't know if you have data already but i was wondering whether you have thoughts about this Edo, do you, do I, you would, want me to... I would pick also suren uh, so we uh, we embed the two okay thanks thank you uh, hi everyone on a really great paper. I enjoyed reading. I enjoyed the uh, results are very interesting. Uh, I think Giuseppe makes very good points just to add to all that possibilities. We can think also about legal reasons. Why? Because you, you started with the legal framework and going back to the stewardship code in the Netherlands, I'm not, I'm, I'm not sure, but if, I, if I'm not mistaken, many countries didn't have sustainability at all. The UK just added last year. Is it possible that the Dutch stewardship code had that sustainability focus earlier? So this is why Dutch institutional investors are, are more focused on this. But my question is more about the um, maybe practical and normative implications of your findings. Because, OK, we see Dutch investors are more sustainable. But what is their impact in practice? Does this also transfer? To, to have influence on companies? Can we save it because Dutch institutional investors are more uh, pro-sustainable? Dutch companies are also more pro-sustainable because of their impact. And related to this, what are the normative implications? How, what, because we see that if they, are, they have influence when we are voting. So does this mean that we need someone to supply that proposal so that they can have influence? And maybe this can be a way or, or a reason to argue that, for example, say on climate proposals, they need to be, companies should put this to vote every year because this is how we will get impact. I think you can take this too, it's already a lot of work. Okay, thank you. Yes, uh, first of all, uh, Giuseppe and, and Søren, thank you for your questions. Um, I think actually they're, they're great. And I was also thinking myself about, okay, so why, so what is the rationale behind this? So why are in, uh, Dutch institutional investors indeed more, uh, probably more sustainable? And I, I agree with the sample um, bias that I have more Dutch pension funds versus international pension funds. So we see that um, in the Bolton research that indeed uh, pension funds are um, having a more sustainable ideology. Um, so maybe that actually impacts the results. So I would like to include that. And I think indeed uh, pension funds have more stable, um, well, uh, beneficiaries like uh, we at this moment, um, but I think actually insurance companies may also not be forgotten because um, actually there we have um, the competitive advantage because consumers in the Netherlands can actually choose uh, which institutional investor related to insurance they, they want to have. And you see now that there is also uh, sustainability ratings, for instance, from the v, uh, VBDO. So the VBDO um, is one of the um, um, investor uh, associations in the Netherlands uh, is actually ranking them and put that information um, as a choice for consumers. So um, I'm, I'm going to look into this, but I think uh, these suggestions are really great. Um, so thank you for these considerations. And I think indeed uh, environmental risks in the Netherlands are very uh, apparent and um, feel like a real possibility. So maybe it's also indeed the sentiments of our country. Um, I think what Søren um, considers about the legal reasons, I think they are very valid. So we have indeed in the Netherlands since uh, 2019, the um, stewardship code, but before there were already stewardship principles and these are already hinting towards sustainable uh, sustainability in terms of long-term uh, value creation. And we also have the uh, Dutch um, corporate governance codes already from 2016, also pointing out um, sustainable value creation and um, also pointing at other aspects. So in one of the key principles, it's really outlined that uh, companies need to include other aspects in their business models in determining their strategy, including for instance, human rights and environmental aspects. So we see already in the Netherlands that indeed sustainability was already included for quite a long time. Um, and actually I didn't know that this UK stewardship only explicitly includes sustainability uh, just lately. Uh, 
I, I thought I actually already mentioned that, but that may be indeed a difference. Um, so thank you for that. And then the, the normal Mative question from Søren. So, okay, what is the actual impact? Um, I'm I'm still struggling how to measure that at this moment. I want to actually establish a database with um, institutional investor actions, also based on their documentation, on their voting behavior, but also on interviews that I'm going to conduct to see whether they actually can have impact on uh, companies with their engagement policies and with their voting behavior. Um, as regards a say on climate, I'm not so sure because it's also um, it's also used in to some extent um, as a greenwashing device for companies itself, as we saw with Shell. Um, it actually um, created quite an interesting situation where you had a sustainability proposal from Follow This and the say on climate from Shell itself, and many institutional investors actually moved. Uh, towards that uh, Shell proposal, stating that Shell already does enough and that they actually show their goodwill um, related to their climate efforts, uh, dismissing the proposal follow this. So I'm not so sure whether um, a climate proposal, a say on uh, climate for um, shareholders from the company would actually do the trick, but um, I'm still hesitant about this. I'm still thinking about what it, what the pros and cons are related to that. Um, but I do see that indeed there needs to be a venue for voting. And uh, when I was reading the final uh, or the latest versions of the engagement policies and voting policies of Dutch institutional investors, I saw that they more and more also mentioned that they cooperate in uh, putting shelter proposals on uh, the agendas of the AGMs. But of course, all of that is more anecdotal evidence than than actual um, um, actual uh, yeah actual systemic uh, research so actually those questions are really great and I'm very uh, much thinking about them still uh, in my research at the moment I hope that answered a bit the, uh, the questions and next one in line is Alessio and then also Jasper can, uh, can so add, I, by the way uh, stop sharing my screen because then I can see you um, better let me see Yes, sorry. Um, Annet, it, it, thanks a lot uh, for, for this presentation. And the, the project is super interesting. I mean, as, as was said before, uh, the fact that you try to, to, to adapt uh, this, this model uh, by Bolton as a quarter to the European con con context has a lot of value. And quite surely, I mean, you already showed us how different that is. I mean, this, the positioning of investors on the spectrum, there will be a lot more popping up. Um, but I wonder whether, I mean, I have, I have three comments. Uh, one, uh, the same uh, limitation of uh, both Patrick Bolton and Coder's model. Uh, there's only some, I mean, surely proposals are empirically interesting because it's a good source of data, uh, but they do not matter much in terms of impact. And we all know that. Uh, so how could you, possibly take this a step forward. You, you mentioned the interview, but I wonder whether you could actually go into elections. Now, the complication is that, as uh, Oliver Arbo put it, I mean, voting is institution specific. So it, it depends really on what you can do with elections. I mean, you can do something in election. In here, it is completely different from what you can do in the US and any other jurisdiction. But election at least seemed to me more impactful than asking uh, investors what they're up to. Second, uh, an another issue with uh, share, uh, share proposal you may want to look at, there's a recent paper by Ronnie, Mike Kelly and, and co-authors, uh, that basically the big investors vote strategically. So the, they, uh, on the votes that matter, the ones that are like close tie, they very often are less environmental friendly than they portray themselves. So you want to look into that. Uh, and the third comment is kind of related because this could be called like a voting greenwashing, but there is a real greenwashing and there is plenty of evidence about it. So maybe you want to rerun uh, your analysis of ideology based on other indicators. So we look at, you know, the next actually is a lead seminar will be about what related to this because it goes Azar and his co-author have uh, figured out that kind of counterintuitively investors such as BlackRock seem to have had a huge impact on CO2 as opposed to ECG indicator. So may, maybe, you know, you want to look into this. 
can we can be revealing? Well, thank you. Um, can I can I answer, Edo? Yes, I yes. think Alessio gave you enough work to answer in alone, and then we get the expert. Yes, uh, thank you, Alessia. I think those are great points. Indeed, I, I agree. Shareholder proposals, um, or past research uh, signals that shareholder proposals have not that much impact, although it, of course, depends on, on, the, on the shareholder proposals. Some actually did have some impact. And I think moving towards elections and how they actually uh, vote on um, or dismiss actually the re-election of uh, invest, uh, uh, directors if they are not that climate minded, then I think that's an interesting uh, additional angle in the research. So I'm going to indeed look for those, um, um, look for the voting behavior on those proposals, including the direct elections. I think that's, that's, that's the next step and that's the missing elements in my research at this moment. I'm also going to um, look further into the strategic voting of big investors. I saw the paper, but I, I didn't incorporate it yet in my, my research, uh, but I think it's a really interesting one. And actually the, the BlackRock's impact on CO2, I missed that one. So I, I, I wrote it down, I'm going to, to look for it because I think that's a really interesting one. So apparently my model is not um, including everything if BlackRock has, with its its behavior still a huge impact on, on uh, um, getting companies more sustainable in terms of climate, um, then that would be very interesting. So if, if you uh, would, my, I, I'm going to look for the for the reference, but I, if you have it, then uh, I'm, I would be very happy uh, to receive it, of course. Yeah, thanks. Really, really great. Ah, you you have the, the announcements. Uh, I'm going to to look for that paper. Yes, thanks. But I, I think, yes, yeah, so maybe to add uh, elections, I think that's that's something where you can have impact as shareholders. Uh, similarly, discharge in the Netherlands and some other countries. Um, those are the proposals that matters to, to corporate management. And that is, I think, where you need to look at. Yes, you're right. And yes, Peter, please. Yes. Um, first of all, uh, Anna, thank you so much for the presentation. It was very, uh, very helpful. And um, I'm here on behalf of Follow This, actually. So this is very interesting for us. Mackenzie, uh, I think you know him. He was supposed to join as well, but he is unfortunately ah, sick. I didn't know. Okay. Oh, please send him yeah. regards. Yeah. Yeah. I will. I will. Thank you. And. Um, uh, yeah, I had one remark about um, two questions. The first one was about BlackRock's rationale. I think the one you presented in the presentation was BlackRock's own rationale and not of one of their funds. Am I correct? So um, that's just the no, it's, it's BlackRock their as funds. a group. So no, that, it's, it's, that was an been ESG a... fund? Yes, um, at, at least um, I, I need to check that because I think that's a very valid remark. Um, in the Proxy Insight database, it was recorded as their own um, rational, but not, when I actually did the presentation, I recognized that the, the general, uh, so the BlackRock in, as an investor was mentioned before the quotes. Mm. So I, I need to check that. Um, well, so, sometimes they can also overlap, like they can be the same, they just pick them from each other. Yeah. So that could be the case as well, but it just sounded familiar and I, I know I have, Black box rationale somewhere, so maybe mm -hmm. it's the same, but yeah, I'll well, look at least into that as there well. was no other rationale provided um, okay. aside that that general rationale there. Yeah. Okay, but it but it was the the funds vote that voted against um, the proposal. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. So one of the ESG funds, I yeah. think two actually voted on the on the, on Shell on the proposal, and two voted against. Uh, it was the advanced ESG. Um, that's two of the advanced ESG funds. Okay, great. And then I had uh, one other question. I'm, I'm still trying to familiarize myself with your calculated method and how it all works. But um, if I understand correctly, basically when an investor appears on the left side of the spectrum, um, you would refer to that investor as green, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, a green is, sustainable because I also have social uh, sustainability included. Right. Right. So that's actually what I was getting at because the, I was wondering to what extent you can take into account the distinction between, for instance, uh, energy proposals and human rights and labor standards. Um, like, mm -hmm. how does that work in the calculation? Can you separate the two or yeah. is it all taken together? 
So it depends on uh, how you estimate the model. So if you include all the shareholder proposal, it's actually exploring all the dimensions of sustainability. But I showed one of the, or actually two sheets where I also have um, the separated models. So I only run the models for the um, um, sustainability proposals related to environmental sustainability or okay. um, the climate um, um, uh, proposals. So I, I try to differentiate also based on the comment I received from Søren to, to the different voting item categories. And I think I, I can do um, more with that. So I also can differentiate, for instance, for human rights and fundamental labor standards proposals. Um, but at this moment, um, because samples become smaller and smaller, I also don't yeah. want to um, decrease uh, the sample too much. Because then, mm -hmm. of course, uh, one or two proposals can have a huge impact on the actual actual position of the uh, institutional investor in the on the spectrum. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, thank you so much. For the last minute, I abuse my position. Uh, I'll estimate most of my comments. Uh, I was wondering uh, two things: one, on the definition of what is uh, a sustainability proposal. Uh, especially when you discuss a little bit uh, charitable donations, uh, if you kind of go with uh, Art and Zingales, they would doubt that a charitable donation is a sustainability proposal. It's probably exactly the, uh, the opposite. It goes more in the Milton Friedman way of uh, uh, let's make profit. And if we have pro-social preferences, we make charitable donations. So I don't know if uh, kind of there's some... Uh, a rigorous methodology to kind of detect what is a sustainability proposal or not, or whether changing this, uh, this definition impact your, uh, your result. And to, to cope a little bit with the um, uh, kind of how consequential are uh, shareholder proposal and also kind of more generally, I think, how the different engagement tools relate to each other, whether they substitute, whether they complement. Uh, is it possible, or probably in some years, uh, to see how consequential these shareholder proposals are. So I, I, I've seen paper, I don't remember uh, which, uh, that measures how um, ESG ratings or other metrics evolve over time and uh, what is the impact of different investors there. So can you kind of map, this is kind of mm -hmm. 2021, I, I, I assume your very last uh, four years, so you, you have time to gather data on how these uh, ESG, ESG ratings uh, evolve that could, could kind of make more material uh, which uh, shareholder proposal uh, counts and also kind of tackle a little bit uh, uh, strategic voting because then mm -hmm. if you, you vote in favor and that counts, it's not strategic. Otherwise, you can, you can rule out some strategic voting probably. Uh, yes, yeah, yeah, good questions. Um, as regards the definition of sustainability, so I... Um, I'm hesitant still about that as well. So normally I have this definition where you have environmental, so uh, social and um, economic sustainability, where you include all these climate related proposals, and then you have all the human rights and, uh, but also for instance, diversity is also part of social sustainability, which is already a bit, um, yeah, moving in, in a more general direction. And then um, sometimes you see with economic sustainability, also like tax governance, uh, sustainable tax governance proposals. Um, I agree with you that uh, the charitable donations may not be a very good category. And I, I also noticed that it's quite a large part of my sample. So that's why I actually estimated also the model without these proposals and the results were robust. So the, the correlation was 0 0.98 um, if, you, if you do the Pearson correlation between the, the for the points uh, that both models estimate for the institutional investors. So it seems that the results are robust, although you see already some differences between between environmental sustainability and social sustainability in my uh, in my results already, so I think it's it's very valid uh, to see uh, whether I can come up with a more um, rigorous classifying framework, not just for the institutional investors, whether they're asset manager or asset owner, because that's something that I sometimes also still struggle with, as I explained, but also whether in, um, a proposal is actually sustainability oriented or not. And if you use the proxy inside database, they actually classify way more uh, that is sustainable than I would do. So removed a lot of proposals 
including also proposals that are the opposite of sustainability. So they actually um, um, demand uh, managers to stop with um, CO2 reductions or these kind of things, which of course I can also still include as um, the other side. So I can actually also include still those proposals in my model. So I'm, I'm still indeed working on what would be the optimal um, sample size for this work. Um, particularly also with the comment of Alessio to include actually direct selections as well. So I think I can have a better uh, sample related to the proposals. Then as regards um, measuring the effects, yes, I was already, um, I already started to do it, but um, the uh, data availability in um, Thomson Reuters, so ICON uh, and Sustainalytics is only for, I think, uh, 2019 and some companies 2020. And most of, um, like for a large part of the companies in the sample, there is no reliable sustainability data available. Either these um, rating agencies are not included somehow in the subscription that we have in Tilburg, or they do not rate these companies. So I'm still looking for methods to see whether I can, for a subsample perhaps, um, measure that. Um, but then you are again starting a quantitative research where you have only the bigger um, plausible effects, I would say, instead of actual causa causality, because I think that's that's impossible to establish. But you can see whether there are some uh, suggestions in the data, whether there are some patterns that you see, okay, so companies are um, getting more sustainable on that specific aspect, for instance, if there was a shareholder proposal on human rights. Um, but then, and also, of course, many institutional investors are engaging behind the scenes. So also that actually adds to the complexity because I mean, the shareholder proposal is only one aspect. So would it then really be the shareholder proposal that had the effects? Um, and then of course you have media attention and all kinds of other aspects. So I'm still struggling with that part of the methodology um, to how to establish some sort of causality or at least a plausible relationship between the actions and results. Thank you very much. I think the paper I was referring to, I will check is, uh, is proprietary data indeed. Yeah. But thank you very much. We have five minutes over time and it's uh, because of me. So apologies to everybody. Uh, ACLE seminar uh, will resume on 2022 and Jose Azar will present the paper that was uh, referred to. So we look forward to see you there. And thanks again, uh, Anne, for, uh, for your presentation. It was great. Uh, thank you for your time, and I'm Please sorry save. that I talk so much. <laughs> Bye. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Okay. Thank you very much. Bye. It was great. <laughs> yes, really? You liked it? <laughs> I, I really like it. I really okay. like it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Okay. Of course, of course. It was a pleasure. We'll be in touch. Okay. Have a nice afternoon. Bye-bye. You too. Bye.